Welcome to Worship with Ascension Lutheran Church in beautiful Nelson, British Columbia. Today is March 19th and the fourth Sunday in Lent. Baptism is sometimes referred to as enlightenment. And the gospel for this Sunday is the story of the man who was born blind and healed by Christ. I was blind and now I see, declares the man. In baptism, God opens our eyes to see the truth of who we are, God's beloved children. Today's service will have hymns, lessons, prayers, special music, and a sermon. Some of us will be in our homes worshiping through this video, and some of us will gather at our church building to worship. Wherever we are, we are together in spirit. And we're really glad you're here. Welcome here. You are a beloved child of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. And so let us pray. From the belief that we have to earn your love, deliver us, O Lord. From the fear that we are unlovable, deliver us, O Lord. From the false security that we have what it takes and that we can do it on our own, deliver us, O Lord. From resentment, or excessive preoccupation with the past. Deliver us, O Lord. From relentless self-seeking in the present. Deliver us, O Lord. From anxiety about the future. Deliver us, O Lord. From disbelief in your love and your promise, deliver us, O Lord. Deep within us, may we know that you hold us, sustain us, and love us. May we trust in your promise. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us, and we are tempted with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The first reading for this, the fourth Sunday in Lent. Middle managers will resonate to a Hebrew portrayal of burden bearing. What does God expect of us? To change leaders is tough. Bosses who are inept or mean-spirited still hold power. Yet bright new leaders may be ambiguous, as told in 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name for you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or in the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's out keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him, now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading for this day is recorded in Ephesians. Ephesus was a rich seaport long ago in the world of Asia Minor. And that fact influenced residents. What did it mean for early Christians? An apostle wrote about vigilance to be aware of bribes that obscure wisdom, recorded in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son 
who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from the one who is the incarnate word, who journeys with us in life and who is God's love for the world working in us, Jesus Christ. Amen. I greet you today from Treaty One Territory, where the building of Gloria Day Lutheran Church is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, Diné peoples, and the Métis Nation. We are grateful for the stewardship of the land of the original peoples. We grieve past mistakes, and we seek a new relationship going forward based in honor and deep respect. This coming week is rather packed, and if you'll go with me here, I'd like to take it more or less day by day. You see, there are all kinds of ways we might live out our faith. We can do the things from tradition. We can say the words that hold up what we believe. And we can also live out our faith, particularly when values intersect with what society is holding up. I would even venture to say that, for some, their involvement in church has dropped because they have seen more of the living out of faith values in society than in their church community. So I propose that we work with occasions that arise and lift up the values that we share. Monday. Well, it's physics, it's earth science, it's astronomy. 
Our planet's subsolar point passes through its equator at 4.24 p.m. in Winnipeg. On March 20th, in our northern hemisphere, vernal equinox. In short, it's spring. Each year, in our church year, Lent invariably takes up most or all of the month of March. So we end up with this movement in the Northern Hemisphere from winter to spring in the middle of this wilderness season of the church. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the Paschal full, mu- full moon, which is the first full moon on or after March 21st, which is a fixed approximation of the March equinox. Determining this date in advance requires a correlation between the lunar months and the solar year, while also accounting for the month, date, and weekday of the Julian or Gregorian calendar. The complexity of the algorithm arises because of the desire to associate the date of Easter with the date of the Jewish feast of Passover, which we Christians believe is when Jesus was crucified. So that's Monday of this coming week. Tuesday, March 21st, we observe Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The United Nations established the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 1966 as part of a larger effort to denounce South Africa's apartheid regime. In choosing March 21, the UN commemorated the victims of the Sharpeville Massacre. On that day in 1960, the South African police opened fire on a peaceful crowd of adults and children in the black township of Sharpeville, killing 69 and wounding more than 180. The crowd had been walking to the local police station to protest past laws, uh, to protest past laws among other injustices restricted where black South Africans could live, travel, and work. Racism persists in systems and institutions in Canada and around the world. Its impacts feature in our daily news cycles, and wherever it finds a voice, it can cause lasting harm to individuals and communities. Did you know that our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada is working intentionally at diversity, equity, and inclusion? The ELCIC feels called and challenged to change our perspectives and become a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive church. In 2019, the ELCIC National Convention directed the National Church Council to create and support the work of three separate national task forces to address racism, white supremacy, and issues of racial injustice, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, and ableism. <clears throat> there are task forces for each. For the first one, on racism, white supremacy, and issues of racial justice, the task force reported to the 2022 National Convention. Here's part of their report, acknowledging how our church may operate and be perceived in society. We recognize that in striving to become an anti-racist church, we are answerable to the past injustices and that we have a shared responsibility to create a better and more accountable church that upholds and promotes the values of respect, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. We commit to being a compassionate church by welcoming, receiving, appreciating, respecting, and celebrating all for their unique identities as children of God, created in God's own image. We commit to working for equity and justice in the church and in the world. We commit to accountable anti-racist action as individuals, as congregations, and as the wider church. We are called to engage in the decolonizing work of dismantling racism, We recognize there are languages, choices, and actions that may serve to privilege certain groups of people and impede others. We understand that the foremost prerequisite to being an anti-racist church is to assume this decolonizing mindset, posture, and lens. 
There should not be any aspect or avenue or institution of the church and its mission and ministry that does not go through the fine-toothed comb of decolonizing change. This will push us out of our comfort zones and into the new and the unknown. We commit to zero tolerance for racism and racial discrimination, and we commit to eliminating such behavior within the church and its ministries. We commit to creating an environment within the ELCIC where people of color feel safe and are empowered to speak about their experiences of racism and racial discrimination and to seek redress without fear of retaliation. We also pledge to ensure that such experiences and concerns are duly addressed. In faithful discernment as God's forgiven people, we, the ELCIC, as a tangible expression of our commitment to address racism, white supremacy, and issues of racial injustice, commit to dismantle systemic racism and bring about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And a list of commitments for the National Church follows. Can we be a church, nationally and locally, that works towards anti-racism every Sunday and even as individuals on the days in between? Hard as it may sometimes be, we do well to acknowledge that, for many of us, we have experienced significant privilege, and from our places of privilege, we can work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion within our church walls and in our wider communities. Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is Tuesday of this coming week. On Wednesday, March 22nd, is World Water Day. World Water Day focuses on the importance of water. It goes back to 1992 at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro. It serves to raise awareness and reaffirm that water and sanitation measures are key to poverty reduction, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. It also aims to encourage action to support the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 6, Water and Sanitation for All by 2030, which is linked to agriculture and food security. Did you know there are currently 2.2 billion people living without access to safe water? Water is life. It is essential in order to produce food. Often where there is hunger, there's also a lack of water that is safe to drink. Sometimes it's the land that is thirsty. Droughts are becoming much more common in many parts of the world, which is increasing hunger for people who depend on agriculture to feed their families. With extreme weather events such as hurricanes, there can also be too much water. Heavy rains and floods can displace people, ruin homes, destroy livestock and crops, and wash away precious resources with the soil. Through its members and local partners, the Canadian Food Grains Bank is helping small-scale farmers get the training and support needed to adapt to the changing climate. Through Canadian Lutheran World Relief, our church works with Canadian Food Grains Bank, and I have seen how small-scale farmers in Ethiopia have learned water conservation me methods to survive drought. Water is so precious, and with an abundance of fresh water in Canada, we sometimes don't realize the gift we have at our fingertips, a gift we must steward carefully and work to protect and share wisely. Everyone needs safe, clean water. And I want to mention Oscar Romero, who we commemorate on Friday, March 24th. He was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of San Salvador in the late 1970s. As Archbishop, Romero spoke out against social injustice and violence amid the escalating conflict between the military government and left-wing insurgents that led to the Salvadoran Civil War. In 1980, Romero was shot by an assassin while celebrating Mass. Though no one was ever convicted for the crime, Investigations by the UN-created Truth Commission for El Salvador concluded that a death squad leader had ordered the killing. 
As Archbishop, Romero came to know the oppression that the Salvadoran people faced, and he used his position and platform to speak out. We hold him up for his justice work towards the end of his life, and even his courage to face armed opponents and not back down. We journey through Lent, and we are met with days such as these. And we might be mindful of how we spend the gift of time we are given in life. Our scriptures point to special occasions and how we, each of us, are called into being and called to join in the wider web of life around us. In Hebrew scripture, we hear how Samuel anoints the youngest son of Jesse, David, as king to succeed Saul. David is not the typical older child who would normally be crowned, and yet he is called. And we know from his reputation in scripture that he is, for the most part, a faithful leader. The beloved Psalm 23 lifts up the image of the new monarch in the well-known line, You anoint my head with oil. And we use this imagery in baptism as we put oil on the newly baptized symbolizing being endowed with the Holy Spirit and each of us being worth a waste of oil. Our gospel text is teaching for the early followers of Jesus. How do we follow the law and at the same time lift up the oppressed? We hear in the verses today of these dualisms, night and day, sinner and law-abiding one, blindness and sighted. Whether it's the disciples or the Pharisees, we are in the same boat and wanting for there to be clear black and white answers to all situations. We hear Jesus talk about working by day and not at night, whereas the Pharisees talk about working any day but the Sabbath. What is the right time for a freeing action? We hear the man born blind's parents avoid the question about Jesus' freeing action, not wanting to be kicked out of the synagogue. Their belonging in community threatened by legalistic views of when or where help might be offered instead of being able to celebrate the new life of their son. We, in this day, from our places, are called to join in work that frees others from bondage. We are called to work towards diversity, equity, inclusion. We are called to lift up the need for clean, safe water for all. We are called to work towards the liberation of the oppressed. This freeing work, this light that can shine in dark places, challenges power structures around. But it is the kind of work we are called to when we are baptized. May our eyes be opened to the needs of others. May we feel the cool waters of baptism refresh us daily and urge us to new life. May it be so. Amen. Please join me as we affirm our faith in the Trinity using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all of creation. With the words, Merciful God, you are invited to respond. Receive our prayers. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit 
and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspired, inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Creating God, by your word you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain ranges to the smallest springtime bud. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the work of heads of state and elected officers. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep, comfort those who grieve, and tend to all who are sick, especially Clementine, Marianne, Terry, Kim, Judy, and Anne. Merciful God, receive our prayers. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and community. Nourish us so we, we can nourish our neighbors. Be with our sister churches, St. Paul's in Prince Rupert and Reverend Diana Eads and our Savior Lutheran in Richmond and Reverend Christoph Reiners. Merciful God, receive our prayers. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for your people, especially Joseph, guardian of Jesus. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Be with us as we live our mission as a community of Christians, empowered by the grace of God through word and sacrament to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Join me in the prayer our Father taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of God. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you as you continue on in this Lenten journey. Amen. Go in peace. Serve in love. Thanks be to God.